Hi, I'm Rain Phoenix, and you're watching our Saturday series, We the People, an intentional conversation about politics, activism, and our shared humanity, a space for political candidates, nonprofit organizations, artists, and activists to discuss the many issues facing our world. Today's special guest is artist, activist, founder, and chair of Reform LA Jails, and co-founder of Black Lives Matter, Patrice Cullors. She'll be joined in conversation with the co-founder of Revolve Impact, Mike De La Rocha, writer, actor, Nick Gilly, and writer-director, Katie Davison. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Rain. Well, I could just jump in to ask. I, I first off, just want to say I feel immensely privileged to be in community with all of you all as artivists and, and human beings that have committed their lives to transforming the world. And so I know we don't have a lot of time, but I just want to jump right in and, and uh, Patrice and everyone else. Um, what do you see as your role, specifically as an artist, organizer, activist in this time of COVID? And, and, and what has traditionally been the role of artists and, and how are you using art to move uh, a beautiful agenda forward? I love that, that question. I can, um, I can begin to answer it and I can't wait to hear others' responses. But, you know, I really see myself as a person who is intervening, an interventionist. Um, I like to see where there's gaps and then intervene and then fill those gaps. I think that um, in this moment of, of COVID-19 in particular, um, we're, we're, we're seeing the realities of corporate greed and the um, irresponsibility of governments. And uh, people are being put to the test personally, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, but also politically. And I think we're, um, we're really gaining new insight, especially people who maybe were just sort of living their lives, not active in the ways that we are, and recognizing, oh, like this country really does believe in money first and human beings last. And I think um, in that realization, I've been so um, impressed with human beings showing up for each other. Um, it's stuff that, you know, Mike, you and I have talked about for years, right? What does it mean to be in relationship in deep connection with each other? And to, to see like the rapid response to mutual aid, um, the ways in which, you know, artists have come together to redefine what this moment could look like. I know so many people see this moment, not just as a moment to, 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 to feel the tragedy, but also an opportunity to imagine and vision a new world. And that's to me is the role of the artists. We're the visionaries, we're the, we're the, we're the folks that give people the permission to imagine something different. Um, and also give people the, the permission to be honest about what is. Um, I'm such a huge fan of your work. Thank you so much for everything that you've been doing for the last decade more. Um, I've heard you talk a lot about how grief and despair can be a galvanizing force. Uh, and I, I'd love to hear you just riff on that a little bit. Sure. I mean, I think Black folks know to the core what grief and despair is. And the fact that we have survived um, really is a testament to how we deep, deepen our resilience. And, you know, I think a lot about um, the moment that COVID-19 became something that, you know, in, the, in America we needed to, to grapple with. The first communities I thought about were Black communities and incarcerated communities. And really, knew that the, the folks at the margin were going to be impacted the most. Um, I want to just like note that, you know, since COVID-19, so much research, we're going to learn so much about what has happened to people because of, not because of the disease so much, but because of racism, sexism, homophobia, you know, classism. Um, but I've, I've, I've seen the, the conversations happening in, in two very specific communities and uh, native communities and in black communities about how uh, it, it's not the disease, it's, the, it's not the disease of COVID, it's the disease of capitalism um, mm -hmm. and, and, and what it's done to our communities and how vulnerable it's made us. And so um, grief and despair is something that's very, um, it's almost like second nature for us, but what we've done with grief and despair to me is much more um, powerful, right? We've, we've made jazz music, we've made the blues, we've created full on movements out of our grief and despair. Black Lives Matter is not actually about 
anger, an, an angry community. It's about a grieving community. And I think that to me is really powerful. And then the next step, you know, is like, what do we do with it? Um, it's why I believe in organizing so much. It's why I don't just make things or I don't just perform. You know, it's another conversation Mike and I have had for so long. Like, we are both equally 100% artists and 100% political beings. And you can't take that from us. And we see both of those projects, the project of, or, or, of organizing, the project of artistry as critical to dismantling this system and then rebuilding something new. Mm. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, let me ask you off of that, you know, uh, Nina Simone so eloquently stated um, that it's an artist's duty to reflect the times. And given the historical context that Patrice kind of laid out um, around the impact of capitalism and racism on America, what are your thoughts in terms of where we are, are now and how we can move forward as artists and activists? Um, let's see, okay, um, first of all, Hello, Sister Patrice. It's so nice to see you, and thank you for all your work. And um, um, I, I, I tried to watch some of your interviews, and, and um, I, I'm really a fan of the, your holistic approach to oppression mm -hmm. and the fact that you see um, intertwining systems of race and gender and homophobia as being um, the result of one overwhelming intent of, of, of oppression. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of that. Um, and so, but to, to Mike's question, um, you know, in line with a lot of what Patrice just said, I agree with, with all of it. Um, I come at it at a little different perspective. Patrice, in one of your interviews, I saw you say that um, people need to know their lane. Mm -hmm. And I very much know my lane. Um, <laughs> I grew up in Chicago. Uh, I knew Harold Washington. And his election, his first election in 83, had a really profound effect on me where, um, where I saw very clearly that I was dealing with a force that could not be, um, that could not be affected by policy or law. Mm -hmm. And so for me, and, and I think I've said this, Rain, to, to you or maybe on another interview, um, I, I, am not, I do not find myself in a new environment with COVID, whatever it's called, 19. Um, this is not the first time that I know that there is a specter of death st stalking the earth that mm. wants me dead. I knew that when I was six. Mm. Um, this isn't the first time when I realized that the, the false Western illusion of individualism is hollow and it's a ploy to make me vulnerable and that only a sense of we is my, um, is my, my, my ultimate weapon. Um, I knew that in the black community, as Patrice said, it's in the music. It's in the history of our survival and my people are from Mississippi and it's how we survive. So um, what's interesting to me about this particular period is there's a whole new group of people that are experiencing complete and total powerlessness for the first time in their lives. Yes. It's, not, it's not my first time. Mm -hmm. um, many things introduced me to my own powerlessness, not the least of which was cocaine. So being 23 years sober, powerlessness is very comfortable for me, for me, but for most of the United States, complete and total powerlessness has them in a great panic. Yes. And, um, and, and I agree with what Patrice is saying. I think that the, the effect of that is it's really making people look at this idea of being individuated and being Western individualists. And you, people are really having to sit in their homes alone and think about that. Um, and so I think that it is creating, um, it, there is the opportunity to really create a sense of the community soul we, which as Patrice said is really, and I just, I just have, a, I have a 15 minute piece that I, I recorded on Instagram about this. It is um, the gift of my slave ancestors who I love to planet earth is an active way to access that soul of we. So um, it, I, I, I am, I am um, curious to see how that, how that will manifest. Um, and, 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 I, and, I, and that's what I'm doing, but I've been doing that as Rain knows for 20, for 20 years. And that's what the play is about. I started the play last year before this happened. 
-hmm. So I, um, it's not new information for, for me in that way. Does that make does, does it, Mike, does that, yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Well, uh, given, given knowing all of you all, um, I oftentimes say as, as spiritual beings, um, when colonization happened and slavery happened, the first thing they did was take our medicine, our songs, our drum, our spirit away. And I wonder if you all can just share, how do you center spirit in your work? Um, before giving my answer, but like, what's the role of spirit in, in all that we do and all that you do individually? Um, I can't separate it. It's the, there's no, there, there is no sense. It, it is what, it's how my work breathes. Um, and, you know, I think for me, the first things I did when we were, being told shelter in place was I went to my altar. Mm -hmm. I went to, I went to the tools that I know best. I went to meditation. I, the first IG lives I did were like literally building altars for people. It was not a political, I was not talking any political rhetoric. I was not talking about, I just, that's not where my, that's not where I was at. I didn't want to hear about that. I just wanted to be grounded. I wanted to be reminded that we will get through this. I wanted to, I wanted to feel myself. I wanted to feel my ancestors. And I wanted to remind people that we have been here. Um, we've been here and we will get through this. We will survive. Um, and for those who won't, they'll be our ancestors and we'll pray to them and we'll honor them. And that to me felt really, 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 really integral. Um, and I didn't even think about you know, I didn't even think about it. I remember the first mm -hmm. IG lives, people were like, okay, what do you want to talk about? I was like, I'm just going to build an altar for folks. Like, that's what I want to do on your IG live. <laughs> and they're like, word, okay, let's build an altar. And um, I think that that, you know, what, that's just where I go. That's where I go. I grew up in a, an incredibly um, religious family. Um, I also think spirit, you know, very spiritual, even though they were like, uh, my family Jehovah's Witness, so that's like very particular religious. But um, what, what always stood out for me was my mother and my grandmother's dreams. Mm -hmm. They would always talk about their dreams and they would always, mm -hmm. it was the only way that I could talk to them that was not, they, they, they didn't demonize it. They didn't call it the demons or Satan. Like they believed in their dreams enough to know that that was true for them. And so I could talk to them in that language mm -hmm. um, because I couldn't relate to them around the Jehovah's Witness stuff, but the, but the dreams was really important. And the last thing I'll say about this is that Harriet Tubman also had dreams. If people remember, she was, she had a, she was disabled and she had been um, hit in the head with a huge iron um, from her slave master and um, it made her have narcolepsy. And and her several trips freeing people, including her entire family, she would fall asleep in the middle of freeing people. And folks would be like, what in the hell? Like, we out here in the woods, like, she's asleep. But when she would wake up, she would have a full on like, okay, we were supposed to go that way, but my vision told me we we're supposed to go that way. And she didn't lose a single human being. And so that was so important for me as a child to read about that story that sounded like this mythical story, but as I got older, I realized, no, this was real. Like her visions is what led us to freedom. And I just, I believe in that so much. Mm. Thank you, beautiful. I say, mm -hmm. the ancestors, the ones that flew. I mm -hmm. um, So um, that's a great question, Mike. And um, it's really nice to know you. I'm just, you know, <laughs> recently getting to know you. And I know you and Patrice have been friends for a while, but I just wanted to say that it's nice to know you. I'm happy to know you. Um, I, I did, um, luckily, you know, I, I sort of did my preparation before this all began. Um, I went, so for something that I'm writing, Patrice, I drove to New Orleans, stayed two days, and then I spent over Christmas and, um, and, um, New Year's, I drove for two weeks through Louisiana and the Delta, stopping at plantations and talking to the ancestors. And it was, um, it was really, really amazing. Um, I just drove county roads in Mississippi and I, um, and I sat in the slave shacks in, in Louisiana and um, it was really beautiful. Um, and and I'm, 
And I'll talk about that in a second, but before I forget, because I'm old and I forget things, but, but something Patrice said earlier, um, I agree with so much about um, what the importance of an artist is. James Baldwin has this beautiful speech that has been put to Matteo Singal music, but the speech is all about how poets and artists are the only ones who can tell us what it is to be a human being and that politicians and doctors and no, no one else can do that. And, um, and so, you know, what I love so much about what Patrice just said too is um, it, for me, all of this, you know, Rain and Katie, as you know, all of what we call white supremacy goes back so far um, for me and the separation between Plato and Aristotle and how Plato talked about that the imagination space was real and there were beings and our ancestors knew that. And the dream space, there are beings that actually exist and they communicate with us. And then Western culture became totally materialistic beginning with Aristotle and all that got swept away. And now it's childish imagination and fairy tales, except for it's not. What's interesting about that to me is physics is now catching up. Physics is now seeing yes. that, okay, we actually don't have the slightest idea what <laughs> anything is, and we don't know what's happening. In fact, when we observe something, we're not really even observing what was there before we looked at it. And, and so that's really fascinating that after 2,000 years of sort of ruin this, ruining the spirituality of human beings, science is now saying, oh, wait a minute, we were right in the original, <laughs> in the original thing. Um, so, you know, what I do personally, though, is, um, you know, I pray and I meditate and I have an altar, like Patrice said, but um, for me, I remember I define white supremacy, and for me, the patriarchy and the home of all of it is encapsulated for me in the phrase white supremacy, and that means a belief that I can increase my self-esteem by taking self-esteem away from you. Mm -hmm. And so as long as I remember that I am not that, and what I remember is my responsibility is to be among others and to be with others. And just the memory of that keeps me in the place, no matter if there's a disease outside or not, you know. I've had a lot of time to look at my mind, you mm -hmm. know what I mean, during this time. And when we talk about like change, how we create change, and this is actually something that I wanted to ask you about, Patrice, to me, it seems like so much of what gets in the way of, of me being effective in the world is just the way that I view the world, the way that I view value, what's important, how much effect I can have, you know? And I think it takes us back to maybe how you even began the conversation, our relationship to capitalism and, and our relationship to, you know, profit versus people. And um, I'm wondering how in this time, like where, you're, where you have faith, what you, are, what you believe in, what you're looking to to build the next thing is it is it institutions is it people are you finding people are connecting more to their spirituality and using that to galvanize new ways of thinking about what happens next sure you know i i think that um <clears throat> before i understood that there was a, a theory of change um i understood that the that the ways in which i was living and that my family was living was unacceptable mm. and so i think one of the first places we all have to come to whether we are at we are people at the margins or people who are putting people at the margins is to identify the unacceptability and that to me is was was really critical i, I didn't i obviously didn't realize that as a child that that's what i was doing mm. but I had the the privilege of being um, taken out of my neighborhood and 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 really shipped off to mostly white affluent schools, mm -hmm. and so in that experience, I would go to school and I would see um, I would see like a, like um, humanity. I would see people being treated as human beings. I would see livelihood. I would see. Um, talents being um, utilized, I would see children being invested in, and then I would come home and see literally the direct opposite. I would see law enforcement, I would see um, uh, rampant drug use and abuse, I would see um, just pain, 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 pain. And I was like, why, why, why is my family 
unable to receive fully, not just me, Patrice, but why can't my entire family receive what they are receiving just only a mile, two miles down? And, and that, was a very, that was a very unearthing moment for me mm. as, as a young person. And, it, and then obviously compounded trauma. So it's not like it was you know, one experience, it was everything. It was my mom being poor and you know, trying to feed us. It was my brother being criminalized all the time. It was, it was my, you know, my sister being treated poorly in her school. And all of that really created um, a, a pathway in my brain and in my body that, that was really about survival. Like we have to change this. I never was the person that was like, I need to leave my neighborhood. Mm. I was always the person like, we have to change what's happening in the neighborhood because everybody deserves something different. And I think, you know, for people who listen to this, whether you are living in communities that, 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 that are being hyper-criminalized right now, or if you're living in the community that is being protected, <laughs> and so therefore not hyper-criminalized, all of it is unacceptable. And so what do you do? What, what, is, what is the next step? And there are so many next steps. There are so many ways we can change what's happening in our current environment. Um, yes, institutions. We need to build institutions that are life-giving. What we have right now are death-dealing institutions. We need to build institutions that are life-giving. We need to be human beings that honor life. We need to be grounded in honoring our life and each other's life. And that looks like a lot of different ways. That looks like looking at a human being when you're walking down the street. It looks like saying hello. It looks like investing in mutual aid. And then I think for me, the, 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 the other piece is how do we then um, remind other people to also join us in this movement? Um, I, one thing I learned really well from the Jehovah's Witnesses was how to evangelize. And so <laughs> while I'm not evangelizing about um, the, the Bible or, or the Kingdom Hall, I am evangelizing about how do we change the world that we live in? Because I believe in us, I believe in human beings. I'm not one of those people, I'm not a pessimist. I'm not one of those people that believe that human beings are just, we're terrible human, we're terrible. You know, we, we're, we're always gonna be destructive. I don't believe that. There is this, we have not always lived like this, right. but we don't always have to live like this. And so we have to make that choice. We have to step into it. And then we have to look around and, once you step into it and make the choice, you look up and you're like, oh, there's so many other people doing that too. You know, like I, this is not a marginal thing happening. There's so many other people doing this. Let me step into how I can support those folks. And I think that that's been a really powerful thing my whole life, you know, since I was a child. My, my dad used to tell me that I grew up in the wrong generation, that I was probably supposed to be born in the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, but, but luckily enough, you know, I'm a part of a, a, a team of people who uh, reimagined what revolution could look like in this current moment. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, I, would, I want to say something about that. Um, but also, I'm, I'm just realizing, Patrice, I think I'm a, a bit older than you. I, I moved to L.A. I'm, I was born in 64 and I moved to L.A. in, uh, in 1987. And coming from because i was on the south side of chicago when it was amazing and beautiful i remember fun town was an amusement park on 95th and stony and you could go there with the family at midnight the whole family would go there and the street brothers would protect the community at, at that time you know that was the 70s and chicago was different then and then i i came here to la and in the paper every day like dozens of people that looked like me were getting murdered and yep. no one north of the 10 said yep. a fucking thing about it right. for 15, 20 years. Yep. I, you know, when, when the OJ Simpson thing happened and the whole city only talked about those two murders, something yep. like 1400 people were murdered in South Central that year, mm. you know? And um, so as you were talking, Patrice, I was just thinking that you were you were young during that period of time and, and yep. that was your environment. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm lucky now I've, I've come to, but, but the, the, the piece that Katie said I wanted to apply to, for me, going through my own process of recovery and seeing in my own steps how I get in my own way was transformative because that's how I ended up being connected with Ceasefire and with Second Call and with 
mm -hmm. um, men and women who are doing something about those things that used to injure me. And, and, um, and, and I really liked what Patrice said about human beings are creatures of love. We've been sold this idea in almost every TV and film that if it weren't for law and order and if it weren't for guns and violence, we would all rape and murder each other and eat each other in the street. Yeah. And it's complete bullshit. We've I mean, never been like that. All the evidence of what humans have been for the past 100,000 years contradicts that. And yet everyone thinks that if the police went away, that we would all just kill each other. It's horseshit. <laughs> The, the police are there to protect property because mm -hmm. we, live in a, we live in a society, the government is entirely criminal and it runs on money and violence and that's it. And not just ours, but the planet. And so we were in a situation where like Patrice said, seven tr billion, what is it? Seven billion of us are controlled by a few million because yeah. we're afraid what would happen if we rel uh, relinquish their control. And, um, and that is something that, um, that I'm, I'm always grateful when I hear somebody say, no, actually, human beings are not like that. And we wouldn't just start stabbing each other. <laughs> it's, it's total horseshit. Thank you. That was such a cool way to like uh, bring it all back around. <laughs> Creatures of love. It is true. <laughs> Uh, God, thank you guys all for this incredibly enlightening conversation. Ooh, this is so good. Wow. <laughs> thank well, you. Love you all so much for the work you do. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to be in community with beautiful spirits, ancestors, and souls like all of you. I really, really genuinely appreciate uh, each and every one of you for what you do. So thank you thank so you much. All the love to each of you. I need this. Talk soon, yeah, everybody. Me too. Okay, okay. Have a good one.